Thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, and before I start, I also want to thank the organizers very much for the opportunity to, to talk. Um, I would have loved to be in sunny Santa Barbara uh, with all of you, but I'll be going in maternity leave in just a few weeks and very much overestimated the mobility one has uh, during that time. All right, so I'm going to talk about some of the most extreme environments in the early universe. Um, some of uh, the environments around the most massive black holes that we know, around qu quasars, around just six and above within the uh, uh, epoch of ionization, that we can now finally study uh, in great detail thanks to JWST. Um, just as a really brief introduction, uh, we know that it's been an open puzzle for decades now how we can grow these supermassive black holes within billion solar masses in size that we observe in the center of these quasars already when the universe is only about 700 to 800 mega years old. And so the red dots in this plot are actually not little red dots for once, although many of you have been uh, making very similar arguments for those little red dots as well. But in this case, they show these high reds of quasars with accreting billion solar mass black holes. And so if we assume that these black holes accrete materials throughout the entire Hubble time at the Eddington limit, which are these red uh, curves here, um, we can just about explain their existence when we invoke uh, massive uh, initial black hole seeds, for instance. But this nevertheless requires that these black holes accrete continuously at the Eddington limit, so with the duty cycle close to unity. Um, but we have seen from simulations that it's actually really challenging to sustain such high accretion rates over long periods of time. And therefore, the duty cycle of these high redshift quasars is actually unlikely to be unity, which, which further complicates this problem. Um, and an immediate consequence of the statement that the duty cycle needs to be unity is that quasars um, are predicted to reside in the most massive dark matter halos that are out there at these early cosmic times, simply because if we had many more host dark matter halos that could potentially host uh, massive black holes, um, then we see quasars, the duty cycle would be less than one. And so, um, again, from simulations, um, like this one here by Tiago Costa, um, we expect um, these, these black holes, these massive black holes, these quasars, um, to really reside in the most overdense regions in the universe, in the, in the highest density peaks of the early universe, with an abundance of smaller black holes and galaxies in the nearby environment. And so ever since the discovery of the uh, first high of quasars, now almost two decades ago, um, people have been searching for this predicted abundance of galaxies in the environment of the quasars um, to be able to, to constrain the duty cycle and the dark matter halo masses and, and try to explain um, the very rapid black hole growth. Now, with JWST, uh, we can finally study for the first time these very, very faint galaxies in the environment of high red quasars, which is what we did as, as part of the IGA survey. And so this is one of the quasar fields that we observed around the most luminous um, quasar known in the high of the universe, J100. Um, we observed this with the near cam imaging in, in the three different bands, but also with the grism, so we get a spectrum of, of every object in the, in the sky. And then we're looking for this particular feature, namely the um, doubly ionized uh, oxygen emission line doublet that allows us to securely constrain the, the redshift of all the distant galaxies within the environment of the quasar. And so these observations revealed an absolutely incredible number, really, of 180 high redshift galaxies in this, in this quasar field and around the redshift of the quasar. So everything that's circled in blue are galaxies that are just a little bit in the foreground of the quasar, um, from our point of view, obviously. Everything that's circled in white-ish are galaxies that are in the immediate vicinity of the quasar, so exactly the same redshift, more or less, as the quasar. And then everything that's in red are galaxies that are in the background of the quasar from, from our point of view. Um, and so in total, we observed six um, of these quasar fields at redshifts around uh, six to seven. Um, and so there's a whole um, range of science uh, one can do now with this. Valentina already mentioned the, the absorption line studies, the metal absorps absorption lines and the lime alpha forest. But I want to focus for the moment only on the galaxies that are really in the in the immediate en environment of the, of these high redshift quasars. So within like a thousand kilometers per second of this quasar, the central quasar. And so these are the ones that you can see highlighted in these uh, images here. And then at the bottom, you see the redshift evolution of all those three emitters in these fields and the, the quasar spectra over plotted. And you can see, I don't know whether you can see my cursor, 
Um, but you can see uh, quite nicely how strongly clustered these galaxies are in, in redshift space. So we're really peering through the different filaments of the cosmic web here. And then this quasar on the right is, um, has almost 50 galaxies in the environment of the, of the quasar. So it's, it's one of the, the uh, biggest protoclusters in the epoch of ionization that we know to date and really resides in one of the most overdense regions um, that, that, that we have with those high redshifts. Um, but on the other hand, we also find quasars like this, these two here, but in particular the one also again on the right, where only two, two galaxies um, are roughly at the same redshift of the quasar. Um, and so uh, we this basically, yeah, it has, it has the same density as an average field of the sky, basically. If you look at any other region, you would expect roughly one or two galaxies there. And so the variance, the, the cosmic variance between these different quasar fields is, is huge. Um, but thanks to the overall large number of galaxies that we can now securely place at the quasar's redshift, we can, for the first time now, measure the, the quasar galaxy cross correlation at uh, redshift six and study the clustering properties, infer the host dark matter halo masses and the duty cycles uh, for these high redshift quasars. And so this is what we did. You see the measurement of this cross correlation function as a function of, of the transverse separation here on the on the left. The black data points are our measurements, and then the lines show where we would expect these measurements to lie, given a characteristic mass of the host dark matter halo masses. And so we get these lines from the Flamingo 10K suite of dark matter only simulations. I think Elia Pizzetti will talk more about these um, in the afternoon. And you can see that the best match between the observations and the data is somewhere around 10 to the 12, maybe a few times 10 to the 12 solar masses. And that implies that these luminous high redshift quasars do actually not necessarily occupy the highest density peaks in the universe. The most massive dark matter halos that exist are redshifts. Uh, these redshifts are 10 to the 13 solar masses and above, and our, our best matches is nearly an order of magnitude below that. It also, in turn, then apply that the UV luminous duty cycle of these high redshift quasars is low, right? So if you compare the number density of observed quasars, to the number density of these host dark matter halos that we get from lambda CDM once we have a mass of these host dark matter halos that roughly tells you the number of galaxies that currently host an accreting supermassive black hole in their center, which is equivalent to the quasar's duty cycle. Um, all right, so how low is the duty cycle exactly? Let me actually add those high redshift measurements here as well. So what you're seeing in this plot is the duty cycle um, as a function of redshift. And what we would expect to measure from our standard black hole growth model, this exponential growth function, is, is duty cycles in this, in this blue shaded region. So above, about unity at, at high redshift. And you can see at lower redshift, this roughly agrees. Most of our measurements are about uh, within this, this, this standard black hole growth picture. But then at higher redshift, it, it drops significantly. The red measurement is the measurement we just, uh, just showed you from, from web. And then the gray measurements are come from a completely independent um, approach from these quasar damping wings that were already mentioned earlier, and I think will be mentioned again in the lightning talks. And so what this shows is that we have for these high redshift quasars a duty cycle that is less than 1% of the Hubble time. So not only do we have these super, to grow the supermassive black holes very early on in the history of our, super, our universe, we also now have about 1% of the Hubble time to do this. Um, and so what does this mean for the growth of, of the supermassive black holes? Well, it means that our current model is, is likely incorrect or at least incomplete. And we have to think of different ways how we can adapt the model to, to explain this very rapid growth. And I'm just listing here a few possible scenarios of what could be going on. And I think in particular, those la the last two um, super Addington accretion episodes that would like significantly steepen um, our slope here, the growth slopes, or um, highly dust obscured growth phases, which would imply that the duty cycle is actually longer. We're only measuring the UV luminous part of this duty cycle. But for most of the growth phases, we would not, again, we would not see uh, the quasar as a luminous quasar. Um, I think those are the most promising ones. And especially the latter has gained, of course, a lot of attention in the last uh, year or so with the discovery of these little red dots. Um, which might indicate the missing abundant uh, population of possibly dust-obscured growing black holes. 
So far, the smoking gun signature of an AGN, their X-ray emission, had been missing for most of the objects. Um, and so a postdoc in my group, Meng Hao Yue, he looked into this a little bit more and stacked the X-ray emission from these LRDs in the Chandra deep fields. Um, and one thing the referee made us consider a much larger sample than we originally had, um, had wanted to look at. And so we actually do now have a detection or like a tentative detection, I should say, but with three to four sigma, both in the soft and in the hard X-ray band of these little red dots in these uh, Chandra tube fields. Um, it's still significantly fainter than what we would expect from the optical emission based on type 1 AGN, um, but it looks like the X-rays are at least present, um, which is exciting. All right, in the last two minutes or so, I want to um, show you some very preliminary work of one of um, our ongoing JWC programs that I'm currently very excited about. And so I'm going to go back to this web image that I showed you before. And I said that every galaxy that is circled in red are galaxies that line the background of the quasar. And so I want to use those galaxies to create a three-dimensional map of the emission of the quasar with the idea that it can help us break this degeneracy between obscured black hole growth and radiatively inefficient accretion. So if you imagine you look at this image from the side, um, the observer would be on the, on the left, and all the galaxies in red that are still in red would be behind the quasar. Um, if we turn on the, the quasar, the galaxy transitions into a luminous quasar, the quasar starts to ionize its surroundings, illuminated surroundings, um, and this illuminated area grows until it has illuminated our complete uh, field of view if the lifetime of the quasar is long. And so wherever the quasar's radiation reached the IGM and ionized the IGM, the flux transmission, the IGM is ionized, and so the flux transmission should increase. And this is something we believe we can observe in the continuum of these high redshift uh, of these background galaxies. Um, so if we look at this in a simulation, we expect this three-dimensional map of the quasar's radiation to look different depending on which processes drive the growth. So if the quasar's lifetimes are, are short, we should only see a small illuminated area, whereas if the quasar's lifetime are longer but possibly obscured in some direction, and it doesn't necessarily have to have this biconical shape, we should see a much larger but maybe patchy ionized region. Uh, and this is something we um, we are trying to observe with Web. We have two programs going on for the faint equator, so for the less good object. Uh, we have the data already and are in the process of reducing it. Um, and then we have another object, the, the most luminous one, J100, coming at the end of the year. Um, and at the same time, we get very, very deep MSA um, observations of, of uh, yeah, tens of, of galaxies. And so all the galaxy people in the team are excited to look at all these emission lines. Um, all right, I'm going to stop here by just summarizing briefly that um, JWC has revealed a really incredible diversity in the environments of these high red tube quasars. Um, and that implies that contrary to previous wisdom, these quasars do actually not necessarily reside in the most massive dark matter halos in the highest density peaks of the universe. And that in turn tells us that the UV luminous duty cycle is low, less than 1% of the age of the universe, um, which really requires us now to think of new avenues to explain the rapid growth of the supermassive black holes and, and possible um, ways of how we could differentiate these different scenarios. So thank you very much. Thank you for a very nice talk. Other questions? Yes, let's start down here. Hi, Anna. Thank you for a great talk. This is Aplant. So uh, relating to the fact that uh, you find that luminous high Z quasars do not necessarily reside in the highest density peaks, there's some work uh, with simulations, particularly from Tiziana's group, which showed that um, aside from the density of the over density of the peak, there's also higher order derivatives of the matter density field that can significantly impact the black hole growth, such as uh, low tidal fields and then high compactness. I was wondering if that's uh, something that you could explore from your quasar galaxy cross correlations. Yeah, good question. Um, so far, we haven't yet. Um, maybe that's the shortest answer for this. Um, 
but it's something I think we can look at, especially if we have a larger sample. And uh, as many of you know, there's the Aspire. So I only looked at six quasar fields very, very deeply um, with a large mosaic, but then there's also Aspire coming um, or it has already been observed, um, which looks at a much larger sample of object of 25, I think. Um, and so I think then we can start to look into more, uh, more carefully into these differences in the environment and, and, uh, and maybe also take the velocity fields. Cause obviously if we, if we go back to, uh, this, like you, you can see that, like, you know, that you can have, well, for the, for what we took was only the number densities, right? It's just the number of objects as a function of distance from the quasar. There's a lot more information. Uh, in this data set, and you can look at like the the relative offset of these, or yeah, the relative offset of the galaxies with respect to the to the quasar, and try to reconstruct um, more carefully the velocity field around that. So yeah. Thank you. Other questions? Yes. Thanks for a really nice talk, Christina. This is Priya. <clears throat> so I was very uh, just a comment. Want to point out that. You know, by this redshift between 5.5 and 6, these black holes are actually well away from the seeding epoch. They are way out of the seeding epoch. So the, any claims that we can make and constraints on seeding have to, be, have to fold in the growth that happens between, say, 10 or 15 down to this time. So it may not really give us as tight constraints on seeding, but on the growth history rather than seeding, yeah. So, but very nice work. Looking forward to the data. That looks so cool. Um, yeah, so, no, I absolutely agree with you. I think it was six, but that's actually the same argument I'm always trying to make when people show that a black hole versus the mass um, uh, relation and argue that this offset, there's actually a of six is, is hard to really get constraints on, on the seeds. But yeah, I think in this case, all, all we constrain, right, is the, is the total UV luminous duty cycle. And when that happens, um, at what part is, at what part in the history is, is, is unclear. Hi, Anna, this is Rachel Somerville, lovely talk. Um, so my question's kind of related to Priya's, and I'm really intrigued by this new project you described at the very end, the, the masquerade. And I guess my thought is that, um, you know, maybe these black holes are not growing very efficiently now. Maybe they have a low duty cycle now because of their own feedback, right, like the self-feedback of the black hole. So is there any way you could detect signatures of past AGN feedback in you know these kinds of observations, or maybe that's even kind of what what you had in mind already, right? So can you comment on that? Um, so I, I so I, it would be nice. I think in practice it's going to be very very challenging. So what you would expect, right, is some sort of like concentric circles or something, and you would you would expect to see ionization around the quasar, and then maybe like further out again. Um, I think, so we're looking, we have observations that take 20 hours, including overhead. So I think 12 without the overheads, just on single galaxy spectra. And from looking at the first object, it looks very, very challenging to see. We have a signal, I believe, but it's, it's very, very challenging. I hope that we get a larger one, um, a stronger signal from the, the brighter quasar. We would expect that to be the case. Um, but so far we're stacking uh, the, the spectra of the individual galaxies to get the signal. And now uh, Yi Kang, who's one of Jay's students, who's going to talk earlier, I think, uh, later on, I think, as well, um, they are trying to model that, I think, without stacking. Um, so we'll see. But it's going to be a challenge, I think, to do that. Thank you. Okay, so if there are no other urgent questions, I um, suggest we move on. So thanks the speaker again for the very great talk.